Did you know that animals see the world differently from us? Take this. Pigeons actually have better vision than humans. Crazy, right? So let's try to see the world from the animal's eyes. Let's start with snakes. Their way of seeing the world is totally different from ours. They have special infrared sensitive receptors in their snouts. This allows them to see the radiated heat of warm blooded mammals. Now let's move on to cows. These big guys don't see colors as well as humans do. They can't see the color red because they don't have the necessary receptors in their retinas for that. So they only perceive variations of blue and green. Also, they don't like it when someone approaches them from behind. They have a near panoramic vision and the only area they can't see is directly to the back. So if you're ever sneaking up on a cow, make sure you give them a heads up. Horses have a blind spot right in front of their faces because of their eye placement. This means they can't see things directly in front of them. Also, they don't see as many colors as we do. Just like cows, their world is mostly made up of greens, yellows, and blues. Poor guys. Fish eyes have ultraviolet receptors and a more spherical lens than humans. This gives them an almost 360 degree vision. As for colors, they're able to see all the same ones as we humans do. But because light behaves differently underwater, they have a hard time discerning red and its shades. Deep sea fish can easily see in the dark, which is pretty cool. Sharks, on the other hand, can't distinguish colors at all, but they see much clearer under the water than we do. Birds have some pretty unique ways of seeing the world. Unlike humans, birds can see ultraviolet light. This helps them differentiate between males and females of their own species, as well as better navigate in their surroundings. Also, they are very good at focusing. For example, falcons and eagles can focus on a small mouse in the field up to a distance of one mile. A pigeon can see all the tiny details. So if you ever need to find a crack in the pavement, just ask a pigeon. And by the way, it has a 340 degree field of vision, and generally their vision is considered twice as good as a human's. There, you have it. I'm envious of a pigeon. Insects have some weird vision patterns too. Flies, for example, have thousands of little eye receptors that work together to give them a big picture of what's going on around them. And get this, they see everything in slow-mo. Plus, they can see ultraviolet light. It helps them with communication. Bees have their own problems. These guys can't tell what the color red is. To them, it looks like a dark blue. How messed up is that? Now, rats. These little guys can't see red either, but that's not the weirdest part. Either of their eyes moves on its own, so they're seeing double, like all the time. It's a wonder they don't run into more walls, am I right? Cats don't see shades of red or green, but they do see brown, yellow, and blue hues like a boss. Plus, they got a wide-angle view, so they can peep more stuff on the sides than we can. There's more, though. When it's pitch black outside, cats become ninja-like, and can see six times better than us. Their pupils adjust to any lighting like magic. Now let's talk about dogs. These furry friends can't see red or orange, but they do rock at blue and violet. Plus, they can differentiate 40 shades of gray. I mean, it's not 50, but still impressive. On a related note, Frogs are really picky eaters. They won't even bother with food that isn't moving. They could be surrounded by a buffet of delicious bugs, but if they don't wiggle, frogs won't even bat an eye, and they're not the most observant creatures either. If something isn't important to them, like a shadow, they won't even bother looking at it. Chameleons have eyes that can move independently of each other, so they can see everything around them without even turning their heads. They can even see two images at the same time, like a double feature movie, one in front and one behind. Pretty impressive, right? What would you do if you suddenly got 360 degree vision like a chameleon? Share in the comments. Fantastic beasts live in movies, books, and our reality. And some of the weirdest creatures live in the ocean. They're called sea slugs. Some of them have the ability of plants to feed on sunlight. Others look like dragons and are poisonous like snakes. Let's study some of the most incredible species. So the first one on our list is an animal that hangs out in the ocean, eats algae, and acts like a plant. A unique variety of green sea slugs can photosynthesize. Simply put, it can feed on sunlight and it will be enough to eat until it's full. But that's not even the coolest part. This creature, which looks like a snail with a green leaf on its back, gets the features of plants by changing its genes. 
The green sea slug gets its photosynthesizing abilities from the algae it eats. And here's how it happens. When the slug bites off the sea plant, it also consumes a small portion of cells called chloroplasts. The slug's intestines absorb these particles and connect them with the slug's cells. Chloroplasts mix with the animal's genes and, with the help of chemical compounds, allow the animal to produce chlorophyll, a green pigment that captures sunlight. The more chloroplasts this creature eats, the better its photosynthesis abilities are. By the way, these cells not only allow the slug to feed on light, but also color it in green pigment, which helps the animals disguise themselves among the grass and hide from predators. Some species of these sea inhabitants can eat algae just once, and it will be enough to feed on sun rays for the rest of their lives. By the way, they don't live long, just one year. Scientists observed how sea slugs didn't eat anything after absorbing chloroplasts. The animals simply sunbathed in the sun while their cells absorbed the sun's energy and then converted it into food. At the same time, the slugs multiplied, interacted with each other, and led an active lifestyle. The researchers also found that this ability could be inherited. That is, small slugs already had algae genes despite the fact that they had never eaten them. We've just met one species of these strange animals. And in total, there are about 2,000 kinds of sea slugs, and they're all unique. First of all, they differ from one another with their colorful patterns. Sea slugs are some of the most colorful creatures in the world. Yellow, mother of pearl, blue, purple, spotted, and many others. Some of them seem to appear with a negative color, while others are painted in acidic psychedelic colors. However, slugs themselves don't even suspect how beautiful they are because they don't distinguish colors. The bright patterns target predators, warning them that these slugs are toxic. Some species, such as the blue dragon, are so venomous that they pose a serious danger even to humans. So don't touch them if you see them in the ocean. But the most crazy thing about these creatures is how they produce their venom. Blue dragons are those rare animals who hunt prey bigger than them in size. Moreover, the creatures they love to eat look much weirder than the sea slug. They're like guests from another dimension. These are the pelagic siphonophore, the blue button, and the violet snail. In addition to their strange appearance, these creatures have venomous tentacles. But the blue dragon is not afraid of them. It uses their venom against them. It absorbs the toxins of these little monsters, concentrates it in itself, and makes it even stronger. The sea slug then uses this venom to sting prey and enemies. Therefore, many predators avoid the dragon if they see it in the water. In humans, the sting of the blue dragon can cause nausea, allergies, and other health problems. Besides the coloring, all sea slugs have different tentacles. Green slugs, as you've seen, have small legs, but the tentacles of the blue dragon resemble wings. The limbs of some slugs look like spikes. There's a species that looks like a mutant jellyfish with wide tentacles. This is the lion's mane nudibranch. branch. Its fins and its head are like a hood. While hunting, it wraps the prey from all sides and squeezes it. Japanese slugs with wavy tentacles are also found in nature. And by the way, these slugs can regenerate their limbs, hearts, and even heads. Scientists watched such a creature lose its head, but its body and the cut-off head were still alive. This is probably the only animal of this size that can fully restore its body after the loss of vital organs. All these differences depend on the slug's lifestyle. Some like to swim in the water, and others crawl along the seabed. Food preferences also affect the development of their body shape. And the diet of sea slugs is also quite strange. Some sea slugs eat algae and feed on sunlight. Others eat jellyfish and sea anemones. And some species, like blue dragons, can eat one another. Now look at this beast. It seems like another species of sea slug, but actually, it's something different. This is a sea pig, which is a type of sea cucumber. Their difference is that the cucumber moves along the seabed using caterpillar-like feet, and the pig walks on longer legs. This creature, the size of an adult's finger, can't swim, even though it lives in water. 
It just walks on the seabed in search of food. This transparent beast that looks like an elephant and a jellyfish does an important job here. It doesn't hunt or hurt anybody. It's just chilling and feeding on carrion. By eating decaying materials, sea pigs make a significant contribution to the ocean's ecosystem, purifying the water from rot and biological debris. They are like vacuum cleaners that clean the ocean of garbage. This creature is harmless, but predatory fish are afraid to approach it because of its disgusting taste. In addition, the bodies of sea pigs are impregnated with poison dangerous to other marine life, but not to everyone. Watching these pigs, scientists often see how small king crabs cling to them. These beings are easy prey for predators, so they need protection. Sea pigs perform this function perfectly, but still they have enemies that can't harm them, and these are parasites. Although sea pigs are not rare animals, scientists know little about them. The reason is the strange bodies of these marine inhabitants. They are very fragile organisms living under high pressure. If you try to raise them to the surface, they will fall apart like artificial jelly. Therefore, you won't find them in aquariums and laboratories. All scientists can do is observe them in their habitat. For this reason, we still don't know the lifespan of these fantastic creatures. We descend into the ocean's black depths to see one of the creepiest creatures on the planet. It has wrinkled skin, weak muscles and bones, and it looks as if it was already born old. The blood shines through its thin skin and paints the whole body in a pinkish hue. However, this weak body is compensated by powerful jaws that protrude from the creature's mouth, making it look like a monster from a sci-fi movie. So, this is the goblin shark, one of the most mysterious fish in the world. This monster is not as fast as its relatives, so it always uses the element of surprise during hunting. It quietly swims up to the prey, hiding in the darkness, and then captures it with its powerful jaws filled with about a hundred sharp teeth. They can't see well in the dark, but have electroreceptors on their long noses. Sharks use them to feel the heartbeat of their prey. Goblin sharks live in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. But most often, people see them off the coast of Japan. However, scientists still don't know their exact habitat despite the fact that they are one of the most ancient creatures on Earth. Goblin sharks have been swimming in the dark depths for more than 120 million years, and during this time, they haven't changed their appearance. When we think of a jellyfish, most of us probably picture a floating umbrella-like creature with stinging tentacles. But these see-through creatures are a lot more interesting than we give them credit for. Some might even hold the secret to eternal life. Let's start with some basics. Jellyfish have different life stages, sort of like how a frog starts as a tadpole. Most of them begin as eggs and turn into larvae, moving with the flow until they find a safe spot to calm down and grow. These larvae then transform into polyps, and eventually into free-floating young jellyfish called medusae. This whole journey for most jellyfish goes in one direction, from young to old. However, there's one jellyfish that thinks outside the box when it comes to its life cycle. On that note, meet Turotopsis dornii. This one also has a catchy nickname, the never-ending jellyfish. That's because it can do something most creatures can't, at least that we know of. You know how butterflies evolve from quirky-looking caterpillars to these beautiful insects? Imagine an elderly butterfly deciding it misses its former stage, and then, poof, it turns into a caterpillar, and thus, young again. Sounds like some sort of magic trick, but these jellyfish might be able to do just that. When life becomes a bit too difficult under the seas, like during food shortages or when it has injuries, this jellyfish doesn't just quit. Instead, it transforms into a small blob which eventually becomes its younger self, ready to start over again. This whole operation is what scientists call transdifferentiation, a big word for a process that's incredibly rare. And it's a bit like they've got a natural reset button. To meet the minds behind this incredible find, we'll have to travel back to the 1980s. 
During those times, some students were observing random jellyfish, expecting the usual life cycle. Earlier stages of development, growth, and then reproduction. They were in for a surprise, though. Instead of following the script, these jellyfish started their life over again and again. And thus, the legend of the never-ending jellyfish was born. A team of scientists got curious about this jellyfish's secret, so they took a close look at the jellyfish DNA. You see, DNA is like a massive recipe book. Every page tells our cells how to work and keep us alive. As it turns out, this jellyfish recipe book has some very special notes on how to stay young forever. The forever young jellyfish has special tweaks in its genes that make it flexible in terms of staying young and living a long time. They have features in their basic code with instructions for repairing DNA, keeping cells fresh and talking to each other, protecting cells from damage and looking after the tips of their chromosomes. Scientists also noticed that when this jellyfish feels like getting a bit younger, it changes the way its genes work. It might be nice if we could steal these genetic instructions and somehow replicate them in humans. Truth is, for the time being, we can't follow this jellyfish's lifestyle and turn back time. While the whole turning young again thing is pretty amazing, it doesn't mean they're invincible. They can't dodge hungry fish or curious turtles. Their endless life has a catch. It's only about age. On the downside, these creatures are pretty delicate, so studying them is like handling a fragile artifact. But with much care and precision, an Asian scientist has been studying them closely since the 1990s. He's seen some specimens rewind their lives up to 10 times in just two years. These little wonders started their journey in the Mediterranean. These days, they can be found all over the world. How these tiny creatures became such world travelers is equally as amazing. Ships might be the unsuspecting Ubers for these critters. They may hitch a ride in the ballast water of ships going from one port to another. Their size and see-through bodies mean they go unnoticed, and their appearance can change depending on their address. Some feature just eight tentacles, while others can sport 20 or more. These differences mean they are also highly adaptable too. At first glance, a little jellyfish traveling around the globe might not seem like a big deal, but here's why it's important. Every creature, big or small, has an impact. While these immortal jellyfish haven't influenced their new environments like other invasive species, their silent journey is a reminder. It shows us how we, as humans, unknowingly influence nature. Despite its amazing capabilities, this particular species of jellyfish doesn't have a brain, or a heart for that matter, or bones, or even blood. Instead, they're mostly water. How do they function without a brain or a heart? Well, the secret's in their cap. They have this unique network of nerve cells right on the outer layer of their cap. They also come with a big, bright red tummy that helps them digest their food. It doesn't mean we should underestimate them. In fact, these jellyfish are quite the predators. They love to munch mostly on tiny creatures like zooplankton. But their diet also includes little fish eggs, sometimes even mollusks. At times, the older ones even fancy eating other jellyfish. They use their tentacles like fishing nets. So they reach out, sting their food, and then guide it into their mouths. These jellyfish aren't the only creatures that might be able to mess with their timeline. Tardigrades might be a word you're not necessarily familiar with, but they're also called water bears or moss piglets. They're these tiny, chubby, eight-legged animals with cute flat heads. Tardigrades might even remind you of a mini version of a caterpillar. Now, what's truly interesting about these creatures isn't their looks. These little guys are known to be super resistant. They can even handle the harsh conditions of outer space. And here's how they do it. When life conditions get a bit too complicated for them to handle, tardigrades just stop playing the game. They go into this very relaxed mode known as cryptobiosis, where they cease almost all of their internal functions. In this state, they squeeze out nearly all the water from their bodies, tuck in their heads and legs, and roll up like a little ball. 
Back in the 70s, scientists figured out that there are four main things that make water bears go into this deep sleep mode. Drying out, freezing up, running out of air, or when things get way too salty. During their nap, these little moss piglets basically turn off almost all their energy. They've got this special stuff in their cells, called TDPs for short. When they squeeze out all their water, these TDPs build a protective shield around their cells, like an invisible force field. And because of this, whenever they find water again, they just wake up, stretch out, and go about their business like nothing happened. Some lobsters can stick around for a whole century too. If you like to enjoy lobster for dinner, don't worry. You're probably feasting on a youngster around five to seven years old. These cool critters can't technically live forever, but they never stop growing either. As they get bigger, every couple of years they shed their old shell and grow a new one. Bigger lobster means older lobster. The largest one spotted was about as long as a skateboard. And the chubbiest, he was about as heavy as the office chair you're probably sitting on. Not all lobsters can reach such long lifespans. It got scientists curious, and they looked a bit into their environment to check for clues. It seems that those guys that enjoy warmer waters can't make it that long, but those in chilly waters like American lobsters can go on and on for ages. The problem with warm water is that it seems to speed up their metabolism, which is what makes lobsters reach the end of their lives sooner. Also, as they get older, this whole shell growing process slows down a bit. It also seems to take more and more energy. The energy it takes can be so much that some lobsters just get too tired. Of course, there are other things they need to watch out for too. They've got to dodge hungry critters, including us humans. Imagine an endless expanse of snow and ice. In it, a hapless squirrel is chasing after an acorn. Are you thinking of Scrat from the animated movie Ice Age? Over the years, the American franchise won the hearts of countless little fans. And big ones, let's be fair. But not all of its characters were real animals, right? I mean, there's no way a saber-toothed squirrel actually existed. That's what the scientists who saw the original movie in 2002 also thought. Three years later, they had to admit they were wrong. That's when paleontologists revealed a fossil of a prehistoric mammal they had found in Argentina. It had a narrow snout and long fangs. The animal belonged to a now-extinct group of mammals that lived in South America and possibly Antarctica. A land of ice and long fangs. It all adds up. The saber-toothed squirrel was real after all. Ice Age follows the adventures of three animals, Manny, Sid, and Diego. A woolly mammoth, a ground sloth, and a saber-toothed cat. They're trying to reunite a young human with his tribe. The plot is fictional, but all these animals really coexisted with humans during the last Ice Age. The human tribe in the movie belongs to the Neanderthals. They shared the planet with us and Denny Sylvans, who lived in Asia. These early humans mostly inhabited the European continent. They disappeared some 40,000 years ago. Scientific evidence suggests that the Neanderthals interacted with the woolly mammoth. In the movie, this is Manny. At first, he's a bit grumpy, but in the end, we learn that he's a kind and brave character. In the second movie, he meets another mammoth called Ellie. Before that, Manny thought he was the last of his kind. His worries were justified. Scientists estimate that the last woolly mammoth walked the Earth some 4,000 years ago. This was around the time the Egyptians were building the Great Pyramids. These animals were the size of African elephants. They are the mammoth's relatives still living today. This now extinct species once roamed the cold tundra of Asia, Europe, and North America. They traveled in herds and had no natural predators, with the notable exception of humans. Scientists believe that overhunting, combined with the rising global temperatures, spelled the end for these huge creatures. In the movie, Manny made friends with Sid. He's a carefree, talkative sloth who was left behind by his family when they migrated. The scriptwriters got this part right. Jefferson's ground sloths originated in South America and migrated across the Isthmus of Panama around 5 million years ago. They migrated north across the Americas all the way to the Arctic. 
Sid is small in the movie, but his species was gigantic. Ground sloths were heavier and larger than modern bears. Just imagine a sloth with its long claws that is nine feet in length. That's more than three times bigger than the largest sloths alive today. The final member of the merry crew was Diego. He started off as a bad guy because he belonged to a pack of saber-toothed cats and was on a mission of snatching the human offspring. In the end, Diego had a change of heart and befriended Manny and Sid. His initial personality matched perfectly with his species temper. The American scimitar cat was an apex predator during the last ice age. It belonged to an extinct branch of the feline family tree. People sometimes call it a tiger, but the species has no living relatives today. Smilodons were most similar to lions in appearance, but they were twice as heavy. They roamed North and South America some 20,000 years ago. The saber-toothed cat's most notable physical trait was its long canine teeth. They were up to 8 inches long. One of the animal groups these ancient felines preyed on was freaky mammals. That's their screen name, of course. In reality, these were large mammals that lived in South America. In Greek, their name means long neck. Their most distinctive feature was a short trunk that bent downwards. The animal used it to carry branches. It was taller than a human and resembled a camel. Its skin was yellow and brown. In the movie, large herds of these animals migrated to warmer climates. Researchers believe this was the case in real life as well. Other animals that didn't like the heat were paleotheriums. Mr. and Mrs. Start rest on ice sheets at the beginning of the movie Ice Age, The Meltdown. Then the ice cracks and Mrs. starts to fall into the water. The likable creatures belonged to an extinct species of hoofed animals. They were relatives of today's horses and tapirs. These animals were the size of a goat or a sheep. The Start family had thick fur, which comes in handy in cold climates. In 2016, Paleotheriums made another appearance, only this time they had light purple fur. Do you remember the animals that looked like armadillos or turtles? They appeared in every Ice Age movie. In real life, the cute shelled animals were called glyptos. These stout animals had four legs and could move remarkably fast. Real life glyphodonts were also on the move. They started off in South America more than 3 million years ago. They moved north to what is today Colombia. Unfortunately, these ancient shelled animals didn't survive the last ice age. The smaller and more lightly armored armadillos are their closest relatives nowadays. When early paleontologists found the first fossil of a glypto in 1814, they thought it belonged to the ground sloth. Sid's relatives were quite popular back then. Another animal that is closely related to a sloth is an anteater. It appeared in numerous Ice Age movies, but there's something odd about the way they looked on the big screen. Have you noticed how their trunks are long, like a mammoth, and are set above the mouth? This is not the case with real-life anteaters. The trunk is actually their snout, and the mouth is a part of it. The species had survived the last Ice Age. Giant anteaters live today across South and Central America. Rhinoceros are also alive and well nowadays. In Ice Age, they were represented through the characters of Carl and Frank. They have a particular liking for dandelions, which were rare plants. When Sid eats their last dandelions, he had to run for his life from the rhinos. He bumps into Manny, who saves him. In ancient times, woolly rhinoceros inhabited a vast territory spanning nearly all of Europe and Asia. They didn't cross into North America via the Bering Land Bridge. Scientists believe this was because there wasn't enough grass in the area. They might seem tough, but these rhinos were herbivores. That means they ate plants, just like all five species of rhinoceros do today. The authors of Ice Age often mix creatures from North America with animals that lived in South America. One species that definitely couldn't have existed alongside other characters was the dodo bird. It lived only in one place, the island of Mauritius, off the east coast of Africa. This is where the locals saw the last specimen in 1681. The species was 26 million years old at the time it disappeared from Earth. At least the creators of Ice Age got the timing right. In the movie, dodos are feisty, flightless birds. 
they choose not to migrate with other animals because they consider themselves superior. Instead, they stock up on food for the coming cold spell. They seem just as determined as Scrat when it comes to finally getting his hands on the acorn. There was this man named Alfred Russell Wallace, who was basically the sidekick to Charles Darwin. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but Wallace definitely doesn't get the recognition he deserves for his contributions to the theory of evolution. See, Wallace and Darwin actually worked together on the idea of natural selection and even presented their findings together in London. But Darwin beat Wallace to the punch with his book on the origin of species, so poor old Wallace became just a footnote in history. Not cool, Darwin. Anyway, despite not getting the credit he deserves for his role in the theory of evolution, Wallace did make some pretty cool discoveries on his own. One of his best-known findings is something called the Wallace Line. Now, the Wallace Line is not actually a physical line that you can see on a map. It's more like an invisible boundary that separates the animal and plant species on either side of it. This boundary runs between the Australian islands and the Asian mainland, and it marks the point where there is a difference in the species found on either side. Basically, to the west of the Wallace Line, you'll find species that are similar to or derived from species found on the Asian mainland. But to the east of the line, there are many species that are unique to Australia. And along the line itself, you'll find a mix of the two types of species. It's like a game of genetic tug-of-war, with both sides pulling in different directions. This invisible line also has an impact on the geological landforms in the area. By looking at the shape and size of the continental slope and shelf, scientists can predict which types of species are found on either side of the line. Think of it as a secret code that only animals and plants in the area know how to decipher. More so, the islands near the Wallace Line are collectively called Wallacea, in honor of Alfred Russell Wallace. Even the birds that live on these islands seem to have stayed put over long periods of time, leading to the development of unique species. If they could speak, they'd all be saying, Nope, sorry, can't fly over the Wallace Line today, gotta stick to our side. It turns out that there are more than 220 different mammal friends who call this place their home, and 125 of them are totally unique to the area. Some of these unique species include the dwarf buffalo and the deer pig, which is basically a taller, skinnier, and hairless version of a pig or wild boar. But it's not just mammals that make the Wallacea special. Nope, there are also over 200 types of reptiles in the area too. 100 of the lizards and snakes you'll find here can't be found anywhere else on Earth. It's the only place on Earth where you can find the Komodo dragon. This amazing creature is the biggest lizard on the planet and is sure to give you a menacing stare down if you ever encounter one. So, how many species do we share our planet with? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward question that seems like we should have a good answer to, right? We just have to list and count all the animals, insects, birds, and other creatures we've discovered so far. Well, the truth is, it's a question that has stumped even the world's top scientists. Now, before we get into the nitty-gritty of how many species we know about, let's start with what we do know. Official data says that there are over 2 million species that we've identified and named. That's a lot of different creatures. But it's important to note that these numbers are constantly changing. Sometimes, scientists discover that two different names actually refer to the same species, so they need to combine them. Other times, they realize they've accidentally given two different names to the same species. Whoopsie! So, if we take into account these synonyms, we might actually only have about 1.7 million unique species that we've identified so far. But, regardless of the actual number, we know that we haven't even come close to finding all the different kinds of species that exist on our planet. That means that there could be many more types of creatures out there that we don't even know about yet. And unfortunately, some of these species may be in danger of going extinct before we even discover that they exist. Some estimates say there could be as few as 3 million, while others say there could be as many as 100 million. That's quite a range! 
Of course, it's also hard to say for sure because there are so many different types of species out there. From large animals like elephants, whales, and giraffes, to small insects, and even fungi. Don't even get me started on microscopic bacteria and viruses. One way that scientists try to estimate the total number of species is by looking at the relationships between different groups of species. This way, they can use the patterns that we do know to make educated guesses about the actual numbers of species in lesser known groups. The answer to the question of how many species we share our planet with is, we don't really know. But isn't that kind of exciting? It means that there's still so much more for us to discover and learn about the incredible diversity of life on Earth. This amazing biodiversity leads us to this next question. There are many species of canines, for instance. There's your average golden retriever or beagle, but those pups come from a whole different species from their wilder canine cousins, like wolves, coyotes, or even foxes. But how come there are no other human species roaming around our planet? Not too long ago, we shared this planet with some pretty clever and resourceful species of humans. How come only Homo sapiens made it through? If some scientists are to be believed, all the different human species that ever existed were descended from ape-like creatures that walked upright in Africa over 6 million years ago. One of the earliest human species, Homo ergaster, appeared in Africa 2 million years ago. They were skilled hunters and even made tools. Plus, their bones suggest they were excellent runners. These humans evolved during a long and terrible drought that turned tropical rainforests into large deserts. But don't worry, they were equipped to deal with the heat since they were largely hairless and could sweat more efficiently. Eventually, other human species called Homo erectus emerged and left Africa to spread across Asia. They were small groups of hunters and gatherers that moved around a lot to get their food ahead of the competition. Sound familiar? That's because they were very similar to us in terms of their body shape and build. Fast forward to around 120,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens also left Africa and began spreading out. Some went to Europe while others headed east and arrived in India, just in time for a massive volcanic eruption that covered a huge area with ash. Over time, Homo erectus was slowly driven out, probably due to a combination of changes in their climate and competition for food. But here's the thing. Homo erectus was actually slightly bigger and more powerful than Homo sapiens. Why did we thrive while they did not? Well, turns out that it's not all about overall brain size. It's more about the areas of the brain that are larger. Homo erectus did not allow much brain space to the part that controls language and speech, which is a crucial element for Homo sapiens' ability to communicate and spread new ideas. With our complex planning, language skills, and ability to trade, Homo sapiens were able to develop better tools, like the spear, which could be thrown for hunting and fighting. We outcompeted other human species, like Neanderthals, who couldn't keep up with the changing environment. And now, here we are, the only surviving human species on the planet. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. There's such a huge gap between us and our nearest primate relatives. And if there were other human species still around, we might not feel so special. Maybe a little dose of humility wouldn't hurt, huh?